So I would like to welcome you to the spring, uh, even though it's happening in the fall, upper level uh, design studio lottery. Um, my name is Carrie Penabad. I'm the director of the undergraduate program here at the School of Architecture. And for the benefit of those who have not um, experienced a lottery, I see some uh, first year students in the audience. I'd like to say that upon completion of the core here at the School of Architecture, you enter uh, what we describe as the upper level. And in, that, uh, in those years, which is fourth and fifth year for the BARC, um, as well as um, students that have passed the core studios in the graduate program, you are allowed to um, participate in what we call the studio lotteries, where the various studios that will be offered are presented and the students rank their studios from their top choice through to um, the various categories of the studios that remain. And so this is new because of the nature of a number of our studios in the spring, ranging from one studio that will be participating in the Heinz competition to several studios that will be traveling. We are trying something new this year. We, will, we are actually announcing the spring studios in the fall so that all of the studios are assigned by the end of the semester and everyone knows who they, whose studios they will, be in, uh, they will be in beginning in January. What I would like to, just to talk a few things uh, logistically, I believe that also Rome, the Rome students have been connected. Um, because of the, uh, of the time of the, of the current lotteries, what we're doing is that we're taping these presentations. These presentations will be emailed to all of the students they will be available, so if you could not attend, you, you will have access to all the video. What uh, Denai and Anna have organized is we're going to do a digital ballot this year, so the ballot will be available to you through our website, Denai, is that correct? How will the students? So the stu you will be receiving an email um, by the end of today's uh, lottery where you will be asked to submit your ballot by tomorrow at noon. So it will be similar to the physical ballots if you've actually filled out the physical ballots in the past, but they will be available to you electronically and you will submit them by tomorrow at noon. Following the submittal of the ballots, um, then the courses will be distributed, students will be distributed, and we hope to have the postings of the studios by, Anna? By Wednesday. So um, one thing, we're going to try to do this in one hour. We're going to give each of the presenters up to five minutes to present the studios. Um, I will ask them to introduce themselves. And the reason we're doing this is because next door at noon, we'll begin a conversation with uh, Robert A.M. Stern, former dean of the Yale School of Architecture and principal of Robert A.M. Stern Architects based in New York uh, with our former dean, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Uh, there will be pizza in the breezeway, and we would love if after we complete the upper studio lotteries, you will join us next door for that conversation. So what we're going to do is you will see the, the various faculty will see the, uh, their descriptions or their posters come up, and that will be the order that we will be presenting. So I believe George Hernandez and Rick Lopez. Good morning, my name is George Hernandez and I will be teaching with Rick Lopez, the preservation studio. Um, it, it is rare, in fact, um, to be a, a student at a university and touch um, and affect fabric as extraordinary as the one that people that sign up for the studio are going to, in fact, affect. Um, as you can see on there, on January the 25th, 2012, Hurricane Sandy swept across the North Caribbean and pounded the city of Santiago de Cuba, Cuba parking itself over the tattered and time-worn and vulnerable city, causing widespread devastation on the island's original colonial capital. Of course, the familiar settings that provided backdrops rooted in the identity of the city were ripped open by these sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. Um, and, in, and in fact, soon thereafter, after the mortality toll was tallied and life began to get back into some sense of normalcy, um, the realization that cultural, the cultural 
fruits of this place, which go all the way back to Renaissance fabric. The cathedral is 1510, um, were severely damaged by the hurricane. Um, the, the Archbishop of Santiago de Cuba, Cuba, who's the primate archbishop in Cuba because it was the first parish, um, met me in Miami a year later. I was able to assist him in putting um, a network of a 500-year-old network of seven urban churches. Let's do the next hit. Of seven urban churches and four territorial churches that create a kind of web around the city. The dot in the middle is the Renaissance fabric. It's the cathedral. The dark blue squares are the first foundational plan of Santiago. You can see it's a nine square grid. The plaza of Santiago is the green square in the middle. The surrounding red dots are the parish churches and they each are accompanied by a plaza. Um, so it's a beautiful grid or network um, that is uh, colonial in heritage. Um, and we, Rick Lopez and I, will travel to the island. The studio, I think there are two studios that are beginning a week before stated class period and we will end a week earlier. Um, but we will travel to the island and be working with the Center for Computational Science to do the documentation. I'll let him say a word or two about the documentation and then I'll close. So we'll be using conventional uh, HAB standards for measuring and uh, drawing uh, our site. Um, the Center for Computational Sciences will be joining us and we'll be collaborating with them to arrive at kind of a um, base set of drawings upon which the design um, can launch and, and use those drawings um, to develop. We're aiming for January 10th, which is a week before uh, classes begin. And as George mentioned, the idea would be that we would end the semester a week early as well. Just to give you a sense of some of these structures, the archbishop who will be working intimately with us is an engineer. He has a rather extended uh, experience in uh, restoration. He restored the church of Bayamo, which, which has a beautiful retalbo, Baroque retalbo, and he restored the sanctuary of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, which is the patron saint of Cuba. It's a very important site. These are just a scrolling series of images of some of those seven urban churches. This is San Francisco from 1752. We will be documenting San Francisco. San Francisco, oops, sorry. San Francisco has, sits on an urban block, and a portion of the block has never been built. So we're going to be docu doing documentation of the historic fabrics, suggestions for restoration uh, of those fabrics, and then an addition to address the dire educational and social needs of Santiago de Cuba and the church's role in it. Um, you will be given housing for free and we may have a conversation in terms of cost of airfare. As I opened, it's really an extraordinary opportunity for students to touch and affect the fate of a world recognized, this is on the World Monument Fund watch list, of a world recognized piece of global heritage. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Jacob Brillhart. Um, I'll be teaching the studio along with Dennis Hector, which many of you know. Um, the title of the studio is called An Innovation Center for the University of Miami Campus. Um, I'm going to read from the poster here. Innovation districts provide a hub for intellectual, social, and economic development, supporting a network that connects research, entrepreneurship, and investment. The role of universities within this innovative framework is evolving across the United States. Um, the size of these engagements range from the 12-acre site on, um, in Manhattan, the Bloomberg Center, to Northwestern's university's quarter-acre garage. Although radically different scales of endeavor, the heart of these in initiatives is centered on the dynamic role of university faculty and students to develop creative collaborations beyond conventional academic and institutional boundaries. So that, in short, the, the bigger questions that we'll be asking in the studio are um, how can architecture inform and facilitate innovation? Um, the dean and the provost, and I think the president, 
have, have been talking about um, expanding our campus and having an innovation center on campus. So we'll be looking at the campus as a whole at first, and we'll be doing a series of mapping and analyzing the campus to find out where some of these spaces could happen. Um, so that's sort of one exercise within the studio, and the second exercise will be to design an actual innovation center. Um, within all of that, we'll have a symposium or a colloquium here in the spring um, where experts that have designed these centers, um, written about them, talked about them, will come here and um, as students and faculty will be able to learn more in real time as we're working on our own center. Um, that's it. If I can, I'll just add a, few, a couple of things. Um, Jake Brillhart and I have been in various ways working in this space with students for a number of years, um, whether it's designing um, fabrication facilities or innovation centers of a of different nature. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us to take on a, the project for the university. Um, the subject of this really is the question of what is the contemporary workspace? And when you ask that question, you have to ask the question of uh, what, does the, what is the contemporary way of working together? And what does that mean in terms of the physical manifestation of the buildings? Because they've changed radically. Um, the office designs, if you look at uh, offices like Clive Wilkinson, the office designs that Silicon Valley has been commissioning for the last decade have really changed the standards of both um, the design, the layout, the furnishings, and the way people work. And this is beginning to populate and change the way, des um, the way office spaces are designed and built today. The second aspect of this is that it's more than just working on your laptop. It's more than just co-working in shared spaces. It's making things as well. So it's combining an office with maker space. And it's, that's what the innovation center is. And then layered on top of that is the kind of support services that young entrepreneurial um, ideas generating people need to be successful in business. Um, the university is, is very interested in the subject. There are a number of different buildings that you can see on different university campuses. So this is our opportunity to work together um, both with the people um, in Miami who are in, in this space, the people at the university in this space, and the people that we'll be inviting into the colloquium. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Deborah Frankie, uh, and uh, Professor Yuhong Park. We're going to be um, working on the computational healthcare studio to design and build in a one to one scale a clinic exam room. Sorry. So, exam rooms are the key components of uh, clinical spaces where care is delivered and where patients are educated about their conditions and treatments. Um, they used to be very physician-centric, and now we have a patient-centric care approach. Their design should support high-quality care delivery and communication among patients, family, and staff. They also should address issues of functionality, flexibility, safety and infection control, and experience. The studio will engage in an evidence-based design process. We will study existing sources of evidence, create innovating designs, and test physical and virtual mock-ups engaging in a quality improvement process. Our work will aim to provide new knowledge to inform future uh, exam room design solutions. Um, this will be achieved by exam room analysis, algorithm design, internet of things, augmented reality assessment, and digital fabrication. This just provided an example of all the key components that we need to consider in an exam room. Um, we're going to break apart every single component and the exam room and see what are some of the measurable outcomes of your proposed design. Uh, my personal motivation for this studio is how to teach uh, design and the design process as a lifelong learning process. So actually, um, the goal of this studio is how to make a studio fun 
uh, like you learn uh, from kindergarten. So I kind of consider this one as digital kindergarten. <laughs> so uh, you make a lot of small things, like uh, as you make a lot of different toys for your fun. And then actually, uh, this one you will develop into actual, uh, just, uh, not just remaining as prototypes. Uh, we want to make it really responsive uh, system that uh, is a one-to-one -one scale model. So you can actually evaluate and measure the effects of the result or the artifact you designed and made. So, and then, so kind of main part of this actually is digital fabrication using laser cutters and 3D printers. And actually, uh, we invited uh, professionals from nurse studies and medical schools, uh, particularly working on robotic machines. So kind of like you will actually uh, experience the, the design process from really uh, design, uh, just design pro practice to real uh, medical practice level uh, um, furnitures and exam rooms. So uh, that's it. And but kind of a, again, the most important part is actually how can you kind of like uh, create an idea from joyful learning? <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is James Brazil, and if you guys haven't met me already, I'm the Emerging Practitioner Teaching Fellow for this, uh, this academic year. And um, how do we scroll through? Okay, there it is. Um, and yeah, so basically what I'm gonna be doing in this second half of our, oh, the spring studio, or the second half of my fellowship, is a continuation from the, the things that uh, we've been doing inside the current uh, uh, fall studio. And so um, basically, I am coming from a studio called the UA Bureau, and um, we are kind of, say, part of a, um, a vanguard of new architects in which we need to kind of take it into our own hands. What exactly do we see the built environment to be? What do we en en envision our city to be? And the way that we work is that we, we reconstruct the city as a prospective project, and this is the most fundamental thing, you know, when um, starting to think of a visionary dimension to architecture, you know, arguing that uh, there's a larger scale communal agenda. And so we'll be speculating on new values of the city and, uh, and really looking at research uh, practice uh, uh, together so the, the, um, and design. So basically, this studio will be split in three parts. There will be a research element. Uh, there will be a practicum element, which is be similar to a design build, but more about bringing you into uh, the realm of a distributed network of uh, fabrication, technology, uh, maker spaces, innovation centers, uh, like, uh, like Jake Brickhart and uh, Dennis were speaking about. So in these last uh, couple of months, I've created this network in, uh, in Miami, in which now we're working with the, uh, the city, we're working with the city of Miami to continue this project. So this was the very first project we did inside, um, inside the, the Four Studio. And as you can see that, um, well, I think you guys saw uh, my very stressed out students and overworked students. In 10 days, we did three projects, design and build from scratch. And so my students ended up winning uh, the, the inaugural competition. And this and the level of design and level of thinking um, on a neighborhood level through, through an informal local action has really spurred the city of Miami to pass an ordinance that made them permanent. Now, this is kind of where the visionary and the, the kind of forward thinking comes into real life. Because if we can start this practice, we can make re regulatory change and we can make it very quickly. And so uh, from now until next, uh, next uh, spring studio, I'll be working with um, a series of partners, uh, say like uh, from um, McKinsey Craft and Construction to Moonlight and Makerspace to Urban Impact Lab in which it's kind of, a, you know, it's, it's a way that I work in many places around the world and we, we set up kind of a network and facilitate these type of projects, enables us to push forward. So we will be doing something similar to this. Don't worry, you won't be doing this 10-day intense design build, but you will be doing three kind of practicums. Um, so I'll bring you outside the university and I'll put you in real production um, type of environments. And we will be also partnering with the third place project on this whole studio. So the third place project is uh, it's a Knights Foundation grant to the MRED plus U program. 
in which we're, we are designing and building two semi-permanent marketplaces in Miami. And this is where the, the concept of the, the fabricating food um, uh, title comes from. And so we'll be looking in partnership with that marketplace you know, how do we research, design, and develop compact, self-sufficient, semi-permanent, and mobile urban installations supporting food uh, oriented micro-businesses that serve as social and cultural containers to, to promote community attachment and economic integration through placemaking. So very much what this is doing about kind of that next level up, how do we support entrepreneurial efforts in the, in the urban realm and how do we envisage you know, to city the bee? So these are some of the things we'll be looking at um, in, in relating to this uh, fabricating food. So I already can kind of tell that's a lot about fabrication technology, it's a lot about community, it's a lot about the city altogether. So we'll be looking at, say, permaculture, uh, farming and gardening, um, a lot of uh, urban installations, you know, pollution re remediation, um, which is kind of uh, very important here in Miami, and a waste energy type of uh, concepts. And so to throw you right into the theoretical part, you know, we look at things that have been happening already. I mean, in the 60s, there was Archigram um, proposing the instant city. Now there is a huge push with, uh, behind Minecraft, you know, computer gaming, um, com computer gaming type of um, ideas and how we can kind of design small containers and we can rearrange them. I mean, kids kind of have the, in the upper level on us these days. You know, they, they can really plan and design and operate a city, you know, before they turn 10 years old. So why can't we, you know, start to take, you know, borrow elements of this and start to think about these parking spaces as a small container for things. So, <laughs> anyway, this is just some of the things that you guys will be looking at. This is the Alapata site, which we'll be, we'll be working in. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And this is some of the spaces we'll be working in. Okay. Hello, I'm Wynne Bradley. Majority of you probably know me um, from teaching in the core. This is a little bit different than your other studios that are presenting today, um, and it is not a studio that you can rank, uh, but it is a studio that you can apply for, and it's more of a program, and I believe a number of you have been spoken to or have gotten flyers on it already. Um, but this is really, it is a non-traditional studio. It is an opportunity for you to integrate your thinking, your academic thinking, and integrate it into the practice. So this is the aim of the studio. It is a nine credit studio. Uh, you will be taking a research lab in conjunction with a um, three traditional six credit studio. Um, you, this will entail 40 hours of working within a firm. So you will apply to us. Um, you will be matched with a firm. The, this current semester, we're running a test. Um, this is the incubation phase. There are four students currently that are um, taking it that are here in the, the audience today. Um, and we will be running it with four additional students um, in the spring semester. Uh, we first tested this with the faculty offices. Uh, we are now, we ran that test. We're now going to be testing this within the, um, the greater Miami. A number of significant practices that are, that are here um, housed locally. Uh, it will be a 40-hour placement at that firm. Um, you will be matched with a firm based on your interests uh, as well as their needs. So it is a, it's a mutually beneficial for students and offices. 20 hours of your time will be spent working on office projects, and that will be considered your internship, and that will be paid. So um, you will also be able to get your AXP hours signed um, from the office under a licensed architect here uh, under this program. The, you additionally will be doing a uh, research topic that will be mutually agreeable or agreed upon between the office and yourself. Um, the, the real benefit of this program, I know a number of you are already working or already sh hold part-time positions, um, internships. The real benefit of this position, of this opportunity really, is that you are bringing 
coming in at a higher level because you are coming in not only as an intern, but you're coming in as a collaborator. You're bringing your background here at the university of research, inquiry, the energetic, um, inquisitive, youthful mind, and you're bringing that as a benefit to collaborate on a question that the firms may have or have had for several years that they just really haven't been able to generate uh, enough time um, or energy behind. So you're coming in at a higher level and offering yourself of service to both their firm as well as the greater academic um, and architectural community. So the details are, it is um, kind of a rushed for those of you who have not heard about this, I apologize. Uh, the deadline for your submission is tomorrow. So by the end of day tomorrow, um, <laughs> you should already, although most of you should probably already have your resume somewhat compiled, you should already have your portfolio somewhat compiled. Um, so it may just be writing a letter of interest to say who you are as a person and what your, uh, why you would want to um, come into this program and what kind of interesting questions you might have or be looking to answer in collaboration with a firm. Um, all of my contact is there, um, but it is, you can reach me via email as well as on campus. I am, have my office here. It's wbradley at miami.edu. Welcome to see me, ask any questions. I'll have flyers at the front. Good morning. Most of you probably know me. Uh, most of you probably know me. Um, I am Richard John. I teach history in the second year. And for the last two years, I've been teaching studio in the second year. But next semester, I'm in fact returning uh, to the classical studio, which I taught uh, for the best part of a, a decade preceding that. Uh, this is an extremely exciting studio because uh, it will be offered in conjunction with the William Harrison Visiting Critic Program, and the visiting critic for the semester will be Peter Panoya Architect. So we are partnering, partnering with a firm um, rather than a single individual. And the firm, Peter Panoya Architects, is based in New York uh, with an additional office in Miami. It's uh, a long-established uh, classical firm in that it was established uh, in 1990 uh, when Peter Panoia, uh, a recent graduate of Columbia University, uh, began it. Uh, he initially began, in fact, uh, really very influenced by avant-garde architecture and, and worked for the Warhol factory and the Keith Haring pop-up shops and things like that. Uh, but uh, he has a profound interest in history, uh, is the co-author of uh, a number of books on particularly 20th century classical and traditional architects. And so his firm is specialized in traditional architecture and historic preservation. Uh, I should say that Peter is also uh, an extraordinarily civic-minded individual uh, who uh, sits on the board of the Morgan Library and, and many other institutions. He was for a while the chair of the board of the Institute of Classical Architecture in New York. The studio is going to be divided broadly into two parts. The first part uh, is quite unlike a regular studio in that there isn't a single design problem, but instead a series of exercises, esquisse projects, and pedagogical programs which will lead students through the principles of classical architecture. Uh, you'll be introduced uh, to composition in plan. Uh, the parallel of the orders uh, will be derived from using original treatises uh, from the 15th uh, through the 20th century. Um, you will experiment with the use of those orders through a facade exercise uh, that will use A-style facades from Letterui 
and you will develop the uh, composition, both in plan and elevation, of a small-scale uh, building, probably uh, a schoolhouse. And at that point, uh, we will have what promises to be an extremely stimulating uh, visit to New York City. Um, the office of Peter Penoyer um, will host a review of some of those earlier projects uh, which Peter will be involved in. Uh, we also will have uh, a number of visits and uh, tours to very significant classical buildings. I should use just a, a few at the bottom there. Uh, the Morgan Library by uh, Charles Foley McKim and McKim Mead and White. Uh, the Century Association uh, by Stanford White of McKim Mead and White. And uh, as you can see, uh, the New York Public Library by Carrere and Hastings. Uh, in fact, uh, we will have a sort of behind the scenes tour of the Morgan Library because Peter is chair of the building committee there, which is very involved in the restoration which has just been completed. And um, he has uh, very generously invited to host a dinner for the students uh, in the studio at the Century Association uh, where Charles Platt's uh, library is preserved and we will see Charles Platt's working process through his, his books. Uh, the second half uh, maybe something like a third of the, of the semester, will be spent uh, back in Miami uh, working on the final design project, which will be a counter-proposal uh, for a uh, prominent uh, current project. Uh, we haven't selected it uh, yet, but we are uh, intending that this should be uh, absolutely uh, contemporary and meaningful. This is the kind of exercise that Peter Panoya himself has engaged in through his office. He produced a counter-proposal uh, for, uh, for the NYPL. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, ask me, uh, but uh, particularly with the trip to New York, which will be subsidized by the school, um, it should be very exciting. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, the Puerto Colombia studio is a uh, studio focused on the um, architecture as well as um, the planning of the Caribbean city. Uh, the University of Miami School of Architecture has been invited to uh, develop a plan, but most importantly, address the architecture of, uh, of a city uh, that uh, is founded in the 19th century, but develops uh, sporadically and with some difficulty, which is not an uncharacteristic condition of the Caribbean city. So uh, we, the purpose of the studio will be to study and develop uh, uh, an architecture that is on the one hand real and true, and as well as uh, beautiful and poetic in nature. The studio is a uh, vernaculology studio, and once you get beyond the pronunciation of the term, um, <laughs> which I just recently did, by the way, um, uh, is, uh, the, the definition of the, of the term uh, has to do with the study of the ordinary in architecture, with the study of the, of the commonplace. And we, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, we thought that the vernacurology studio would be the right place for this because these are, in fact, uh, cities that have developed an architecture that is uh, intimate and um, informal and uh, um, outside, let's say, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of high art and the history of architecture. The city is in the northern coast of Colombia, in uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's a support town uh, of about uh, 100,000, population of about 100,000. Um, and we would be, it's a sponsored studio, we would be traveling to visit the site and, uh, and uh, study and draw, document the, uh, the place. It's also a studio that is being um, uh, uh, that is being worked in conjunction with Xin Hao, Xinhua, Xinhua, excuse me, Xinhua University from Beijing. 
And uh, the idea is to have a parallel uh, 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 studio uh, with uh, CC cameras <laughs> that would um, uh, record the studio throughout, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the semester. It should prove to be a very interesting studio. These are the general points. I think Adib can address more, uh, more specific as aspects of the studio. We do, though, require that the students that sign up for the studio are students, very, students willing to work hard and long hours in the studio, by the way, uh, because it is a great um, uh, uh, endeavor. By great, I mean uh, 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 a great effort. Uh, because there is a master plan to be done as well as architecture, of course. So yes, as Professor Victoria just mentioned, the initial effort will be to, to develop a master plan for this waterfront uh, city, uh, which is very close to Barranquilla, Colombia, along the Magdalena River, those of you who are familiar with its geography, and within driving distance of Cartagena, a very beautiful colonial city, about a 45 minute drive away. Uh, the, uh, Im immediately after our visit, we'll engage this master plan, and then immediately after, we will, we will dedicate the remainder of the semester to developing different types of projects that would range from communal, communal spaces to, to high-rise buildings, actually, that are going to be developed along this waterfront uh, moment in the city. And by the way, this is a studio that has been, uh, the vernacularology studio has been taught before and in the past, we've traveled to Barranquilla and we've traveled to Guatemala, actually, to study very, very similar conditions within, this, within these places. And we have produced projects as the one that you see on this wall, on the wall at the moment. That's an image of uh, a view of Puerto Colombia as you stand along, along the coastline looking at the Caribbean. It's a fantastic place, very beautiful place, and an opportunity for those of you who haven't been there and studied these particular places to study it, perhaps for the first time. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, I think uh, most of you may not know me before. So uh, my name is Zhao Pei, and uh, I come here as visiting professor for nine months. So I will take one studio for next semester. Uh, the title is the Chinese Urbanization Studio. Oh, sorry, which button is this? And so before that, I think I have to brief some like a background of this studio. So I, first of all, I show you some photos. This photo actually take, uh, in, took in last week uh, in Peking. So the, you can see the, this very heavy smog. So all the city under the smog, only like several 500 meters towers above the frog. So it's horrible view, actually. And then another view is about the traffic. This is very normally rushing hour time in Peking. So, the, so the, actually the highway becomes the parking lot now. So facing this heavy traffic and the heavy pollution issue, and the Peking also with more than 20 million population. So this is kind of like a very big problem for this mega city. So to relieve the burden of the central city in the 2015 Peking, uh, city government formally issued an administrative, administrative sub-center plan to relocate most functions of the city government to the Tongzhou. Uh, Tongzhou actually is a small town with one hour driving away from Peking. And this is a map. You can see it's from the down center of the Peking to the Tongzhou. It's uh, about uh, 14 kilometers away. So this is uh, Tongzhou's, uh, uh, this, this small town's map. I mean, it's, it's still a huge town, but in China, it's still a small town. And this uh, drawing, I mean, rather I, I grabbed from the internet, it's kind of like, a, it's more like a, this, the Peking city government promotion uh, image, rendering image. I mean, you can see it's horrible. I mean, they trying to, transforming a small rural town as this modern, this pure modern high-rise building town. So this, this is not what we're trying to do. 
So also, I think in next year, there is something we should consider. So this is not actually small town. So in the next few years, there will be like 0.4 million people will move into the Tongzhou. As the result of Tongzhou, you mean now it's only the center of the city is very small. So it has to be redeveloped to meet this, uh, to match this meet. So next time, uh, after that, because you, you, now you, you may think it's like a very gigantic like uh, urban, uh, urban planning project, or it's kind of like a very utopian or like, uh, you know, some massing city. But I'm thinking now we, I have to explain why we are in this project, why, why are we trying to do this video? I think the first reason is uh, this project may be the biggest urban project in, the, in this century. I mean, you can tell uh, what's the scale. And also, second reason is in it's some extraordinary and ambitious urban testing in case of the time of the scale of this project. It's kind of like a one hybrid of the desire of the extreme modernism, utopia, and the national capitalism, and the post-socialism. So it's, it's many things behind this project. So I think it's, a, it's not only about challenge of our professional, also about challenge of our imagination. So the only precedent case that I can think is about is I can find is in Brazil and in the 1950s is Basilia. The, sec uh, the third reason is the project is just uh, in the starting point now. So there are many chances we can take. And any thought we proposed may bring some changing. I mean, you see the rendering photo that uh, issued by government is a horrible image. So we try to bring some change for this uh, project in the future. Although it may be very tough and tiny, of course we can do that huge bunch of things. And the first reason is, uh, uh, that's what I'm thinking about, is it will help us to understand uh, another reality in this world uh, profoundly. Very possibly in the future, we will, see you, we will see some similar situation in the East Asia, Middle Asia, South America, and Africa. This is what I learned from my Latin American research because uh, nothing is impossible. Okay, sorry, I'm quickly. So uh, what is our studio uh, plan? I think the studio plan is uh, uh, we have to take a position to shift things to this, uh, I mean, how to the ground the narr narr narrative uh, project into the actor design. So I think I, I will take the anthropological investigation field work plus the actor design. So this is a schedule, a rough schedule. It, uh, I'm just mentioning we will have like a one week trip to China in the spring break uh, and also finally, uh, the final production we will deliver to the government, uh, Peking government. So uh, this is the slide. I'm just quickly get through with, uh, several potential sites. And all the sites is around uh, one, one acre. With the site area is uh, one acre hectare. So uh, to remove this uh, extremely urban test and uh, even to also observe it uh, as the first witness. So welcome everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna go super fast. Um, I'm Joanna Lombard, Laura Heary, Veruska Vasquez, and Chuck Bull is also working on this. I'm gonna tell you really fast the overall of urban design. I'm gonna explain the team, and then we'll be available for questions after because we need to get to Robert Stern in the next uh, 15 minutes. So essentially, I think you know the urban design program, the Masters of Urban Design. The two semester program starts out in the fall. They do a greenfield project. In the spring, it's an infill project, looking at an area that's under stress, that needs some help and transformation. And so that, pro that studio normally starts with the Heinz competition. This year, we have a really interesting opportunity because um, in forming our team, well, first of all, Veruska and I did two of these kinds of studios in the past. And then last year, she worked with two of the teams that entered Heinz from UM. And you may know one of them made it to one of four finalists out of the 159 entries. 
and one was honorable mention. It's always great to be a finalist because you win $10,000, but if you win the whole thing, you get $50,000. So we thought, well, let's take the expertise because Verusco was able, although the students don't sit in, Verusco was able to sit in on the jury panel, so she got to hear all the presentations and all the comments about the student project. We want to take that knowledge and apply it to the teams. So Liz and Chuck said, what if instead of having students do it on their own outside of the studio, we actually bring it in the studio and we give you support and we have workshops in the fall. We just did a finance workshop last Friday. We've got presentation workshops and really give you the tools to win. So that's the first part of the project. Plus, it's perfect for the infill because it, Heinz always takes an area that needs some transformation and you end up doing this plan for it. The second half of the project, and Laura's perfect to help us with this too because Laura has been a longtime member of the Urban Land Institute in the leadership role. And I, Laura and I started working together when she led for the Congress of the New Urbanism, the Health District Initiative. So we have a, a long time association and the three of us are pretty excited about the next project which Laura has led for us, which is a project in Atlanta. It's a really amazing neighborhood and I'm gonna show it to you here. Um, it's, it's an area that's kind of under stress, and you'll see the Bankhead Marches Station over to the right. You see that big green area up there with Proctor Creek? That's gonna become a destination park in Atlanta. The Grove Park neighborhood and the Bankhead neighborhoods are in the middle of that. Really interesting historic African-American community. Had 7,000 people in the 1960s, has 3,000 people now. Lots of vacant properties, troubled economics, troubled health and we're gonna go in and turn it into a health improvement district. We're working with the, Atlanta has just been named one of the Rockefeller Resilient Cities, the White House Resilient City Initiative, and the Rockefeller Resilient Cities are focusing on health improvement, so we're focusing on a health improvement district. Those of you that are fans of the Netflix series Stranger Things might remember this image. This is a key part of that show. It's the quarry, which is going to be the centerpiece of the park, which is adjacent to the site, which is a regional destination. And these are some of the project goals that we're gonna to try to get at in terms of resilience in Atlanta that has been defined uh, by their committee and then looking at it from a health improvement role from ours. And then I wanted to just close really fast with the current mayor of Atlanta because his message to us is really why we are all here doing all these studios together, that when this work is all done, it will be a place where lives are improved and will be part of an overall transformation. And in his case, it's in this neighborhood. In our case, it's for all of us, and we are just getting started. So thank you very much. Hello, my name is Roberto Bejar, and um, as usual, we are going to be working. We are going to be working in New York City. In this case, though, it's slightly different because um, school has developed a new partnership with the Cooper Union School of Architecture, and Nader Terrani, he's um, the, the dean at that school. And what we are going to be doing is working together with a, a faculty member and students from Cooper Union in both New York City and Miami. Um, students of both schools are to choose between two sites, either in Miami or New York City. Both sites are quite extraordinary. One in downtown, both sites are waterfront sites in um, downtown Miami and um, Chelsea or the Meatpacking District in Manhattan. And, um, should be a pretty interesting studio, nonetheless, because we're working with the Cooper Union, and there should be a good um, uh, interchange of uh, ideas between students there and here and here and there. Um, the, um, the, the students to be traveling to New York City, we are to study the architecture of the city, in particular classic examples such as in a couple of tours, uh, classic examples such as the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, and uh, the Rockefeller Center, as well as the Seagram Building. And, um, and um, in a second and third tour, we're gonna be visiting a number of uh, contemporary uh, interpretations of the city by 
uh, architects such as um, um, Aldo Rossi, Herzog de Miron, uh, uh, and Sana, and Frank Gehry, actually. Um, in addition to that, we're going to visit the Donald Judd Foundation in Soho, um, which should be quite interesting, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's a classic um, um, cast iron building in the Soho district in Manhattan. And um, students are to choose the program. It's, um, it's, um, it's, um, it's a big program. Uh, um, it's a, as I said, it's a waterfront, high rise, a, a mixed use plus public space building. Uh, our idea is for each of the students, each of the teams of two students to choose a site, either in downtown Miami or New York City, and to develop a basic program with the aim of developing a project that um, that is both related to the city where, it's, uh, where, it's, uh, where, it, where it takes place, but at the same time reinvents uh, uh, the city by means of an architecture that belongs to the place and at the same time is able to construct public space, becoming a landmark for either of um, both um, cities. Um, we're going to have a short period of uh, research, like a third, let's say, of time, researching the architecture of Miami. And, and um, well, we're going to be researching the architecture of New York City and going to the city. And then two thirds of the time will be invested in the project proper. Thank you. Okay, so Carrie's letting me re mention something I totally forgot, which my teammates reminded me, that um, we are going to do a trip to Atlanta. Thanks to Laura's advocacy with community groups, it's funded. We'll be doing the Atlanta Beltline, which is in relation to it. So it'll be, we think, a kind of one-day trip, and it's already scheduled for the 30th of January. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Okay, so we are almost on time in the sense that um, Anna and Denai would like us to, if you could quickly text a response to this question. Um, we are, are experimenting with announcing the studio uh, lottery the semester prior, um, and so we, we discussed it internally, um, but we wanted your feedback. If you would prefer on Fridays or if you could answer this quickly, we would really appreciate it uh, for future reference. However, um, most importantly, I'd just like to remind you that the ballots will be available electronically. We will ask that if you are not here, you will have access to the video of today's presentations, and if